What's up Valley Creek students? We're in the middle of a series right now called the Hope Carrier Initiative, where we're learning more about what the kingdom of God is, how to live in it, and how to release it to the world around us. And this week, Pastor John gave us a little bit of a weather forecast, or a sense of what might be going on in this season. And the weather forecast calls for partly edgy with a slight chance of old struggles reappearing. So don't be surprised if you see a bit of edginess or a bit of frustration, or maybe you feel a bit of tension inside of you. Maybe you've already started to see this. You've seen some old struggles start to reappear in your life. That old sin pattern or that mental health challenge that you thought you were on top of is starting to show back up in your life. So don't be surprised if in this season you experience a bit of edginess or frustration. Why? Well, because you're moving forward in the kingdom of God and your flesh can't come with you. Let me say that again. You're moving forward and the kingdom of God and your flesh can't come with you. Your flesh, your human nature without God, can't come with you into the kingdom. And so your flesh is reacting. Come on, we're moving forward into the kingdom and movement always creates friction. But in the process, we're becoming more like Jesus than ever before. That frustration is just our hearts learning how to live in the realities of the kingdom. And that tension is between the kingdom of God within you and the kingdom of this world around you. So don't feel discouraged. God's grace is sufficient for you. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. In Jesus, you are a new creation. So if you feel any sort of edginess, that's okay. Let's just acknowledge it and bring it into the light. Maybe even share it with your circle and let's move forward together by faith. Remember, the kingdom of God is anywhere that God's will is done. It's anywhere that is submitted to the rule and to the reign of Jesus. And God's will is to be good to you. God has a good will toward you. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That is the good news of the kingdom. Check this out. The gospel of the kingdom. And if you've been here, you know the three circles but you've probably never realized that it is the good news of the kingdom. And if you've never been here and you've never heard the three circles before, it is a way of contextualizing the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom. So walk or just right now, just say, Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive the good news of the kingdom. Because this is the message of Jesus. See, in Jesus, we receive his grace, experience his presence and release his kingdom. He restores our identity. He reconciles our relationship and he redeems our purpose. It's not about getting to heaven when you die. It's about being restored in every way. This is the gospel of the kingdom. And it all starts with grace. You have been saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no man can boast. The word save in the Bible literally means to save, to heal, to make whole, to set free and deliver. It doesn't mean to heaven when you die. It means to be whole and to be restored in every way, shape, and form in the here and the now. And there's three words you have to understand. Judgment, mercy, and grace. Judgment is when you get what you do deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. And grace is when you get what you didn't deserve. Judgment, you get what you deserve. Mercy, you don't get what you do deserve. Grace, you get what you didn't deserve. On the cross, Jesus was judged on our behalf. He got what we deserved so we could experience grace and get what he deserved. He not only forgives our sins, he credits our account. He not only cancels the debt, he literally restores our identity, makes us a new creation, gives us a completely new nature and includes us in himself which means that everything that is true of Jesus is now true of you. You say, well, where do you get that? As he is, so we are in this world. Because as he is, so we are in this world. Because he is righteous, so am I. Because he is holy, so am I. Because he is loved, so am I. Because he is free, so am I. Because he is in the kingdom, so am I. Everything that is true of him is now true of me because I've been included in him. This is the kind of grace that we're talking about. In fact, this is an incredibly foundational verse to know. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, 
The many were made sinners. Identity statement. This is not an action, it's an identity statement. So also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Not an action statement, an identity statement. So through the unsurrendered will of Adam, you became identity, a sinner. But through the surrendered will of Jesus, you are now righteous. So see if you can catch this. When you were born, you were born in a prison of sin. You were born as a sinner. That was the extent in this, the expanse of your life. And you are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Why? Because identity determines behavior. Who you are determines what you do. You were born as a sinner. It's an identity statement. The extent of your life is a life of sin. That's all you can do because you can only do who you are. And you were born in this prison of sin and there was nothing you could do to get yourself out of it. So we shouldn't be surprised when the world does broken things because their identity is broken. It's the extent of what they can do. There was nothing good you could do to get out of it. But then Jesus came and he rescued you from the prison of sin and he put you into a position of righteousness. You're now righteous, not because you live righteously. You live righteously because you now are righteous because identity determines behavior. Who you are determines what you do. And just like there was nothing good you could do to get out of the prison of sin, there is nothing bad you can do to get out of this position of righteousness. The Bible literally says you are a slave to righteousness. Uses that word. Why? Because you can't free yourself. You are a slave to sin, couldn't free yourself. You're a slave to righteousness. You can't free yourself because it's your identity. And you have no authority or ability to change your identity. It's who you are in Jesus. In fact, this is why it says God made him Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us on the cross so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God It's who you now are. And this is where we need our faith to grow. Come on. The Bible says faith comes by so whatever I'm hearing, my faith in that thing grows. If you've ever wondered why we don't spend all of our time talking about how bad you are and how much sin is in your life and how you should try so much harder, it's because you don't need your faith to grow in that anymore. We spend all our time talking about Jesus and who he is and what he has done because we all need our faith to grow in the goodness of his grace, not in the strength of sin. Come on, if we spend more time talking about what we have to do than what Jesus has done, something is wrong because on the cross, he said, it is finished, not I'm working on it. Come on, think about this. The Holy Spirit now dwells inside of you. If the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, that means you are now holy. The temple was holy, not because of the gold or the silver, but because the Holy Spirit was there. You are not holy because of what you do, but because the Holy Spirit is in you and he only dwells in holy places with me on this. Come on. When Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's 30 years old. He hasn't done any miracles yet. And the father declares his identity and says he loves him and he is pleased in him. If you're included in Jesus, then that means you are the father's beloved son or beloved daughter in whom he is well pleased before you do anything right. And even after you do everything wrong, you don't have to spend your life getting the world to say what the father already has, that he is pleased with you and that he loves you. You are free. You are as loved in this moment as you will ever be in your life. What are you trying to prove and who are you trying to prove it to? So we receive his grace. He restores our identity and then it draws us into experiencing his presence or a reconciled relationship. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence because of what Jesus has done. God's throne is a throne of grace, not judgment, condemnation, anger, harshness. It's grace. We can go with confidence. 
in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. You can approach God with a full freedom and a confidence that he wants you, that he has accepted you, that he loves you because of what Jesus has done. In fact, you can be as close to God as you want to be. You are as close to God right now as you want to be. The only distance that exists between you and God is that which you choose because he already chose to close the gap. He already chose to move in as close as possible. And now he's just asking you, do you want to turn your heart to me with freedom and with confidence, fully known, fully loved with no fear of rejection? He will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, has come down to be a father to you. You see, Jesus in the only place where he defines eternal life, says this is eternal life, that they will go to heaven when they die. Man, I'm really hitting that hard in this series, aren't I? This is eternal life that they may know you. The word no does not mean no, it means relationship experience. You don't have to wait till you die to experience eternal life, you can have it right now. You can be as close to God as you wanna be because he who's been forgiven much, loves much, and I'm not afraid of him anymore. And then as I experience his presence, I move into this place of releasing his kingdom, living a redeemed purpose. Because all of a sudden I wake up one day and I realize I've been empowered by God. I've been commissioned to rule and reign with him. I've been sent as Jesus was sent with the power and authority in my life. I don't have to wonder why I'm here. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Let's go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I'm in. How about this? When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick to destroy the works of the devil. Power and authority. Authority, the right to do it. Power, the ability to do it. Authority is about having the right to do something. Power is about having the ability to do something. And you and I are in many places in our lives where we have the right, but not the power. And sometimes we have the power, but not the right. Jesus gave them both the power, the, the ability and the right the authority to go and destroy the works of darkness. And where these cross over is the kingdom of God, the Father's heart. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by my knee. So Jesus is the way, but the Father, the kingdom, is the destination. So now see how these work together. When I receive his grace, I'll experience his presence and I'll release his kingdom. When I knew who I am, I know who he is and I know what I'm created to do. If I believe I'm a beloved son, I will run to the father and I will spend my life building his kingdom. When I know I'm forgiven, I will never be afraid of him and I will want to be a part of what he is doing. But if I resist his grace, I'll avoid his presence. And I'll spend my life building my own kingdom. If I don't know who I am, I don't know who he is and I won't know what I'm created to do. If I believe I'm a spiritual orphan, I will be terrified of God and I will spend my life taking care of myself. If I am full of shame and guilt and condemnation, I will avoid God with everything I've got and I will try to do things to pay for my past. The problem is a lot of us, we invert this and we start here and we do a bunch of stuff so God will accept us so we can pay for our past. We try harder, behave better, perform, earn, strive, struggle, try to do all these things so that God will accept us so that someday I can be forgiven and be significant. This is the cycle of performance and it is an exhausting way to live. You don't have to do to become. You do because you already are. You don't have to live your life to become accepted. You live from acceptance. You don't have to live from approval. You live for approval. You don't have to live for, for significance. You live from significance. You are already as loved in this moment as you will ever be in your life. All you need to do is look at the behaviors in your life and see where they're off and track them back to where the broken belief is. If you're constantly anxious, maybe it's because you don't really trust God. 
Maybe you don't trust God because a spirit of condemnation of fear is at work in your life. If you're always stressed out, maybe it's because you believe God is distant and somewhere way out there and you believe that you're an orphan who has to take care of themselves. If you're always performing, maybe you believe that God's demanding and no one loves you for who you are, but for what you do. If you're constantly sinning in your life, you probably believe that God is mad at you and it's probably because you don't believe that you're a new creation yet in Christ Jesus. Are you with me on this? Come on, the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is that Jesus came to restore our identity, reconcile our relationship with God and redeem our purpose. God has given us grace, undeserved favor and supernatural empowerment so that we can believe differently and so that we can live differently. So whether this is your first time hearing the three circles or you've heard it a hundred times before, God has something new for you to discover. So. Let's turn to our tables now and discover it together.